Hey guys, so recently the stable version 1.1.0 of the constraint layout has been released and together with it we get some new features that we want to take a look at now. And as a reminder, you can always find all my videos, code examples and blog posts on codinginflow.com. So let's switch over into our layout editor, where I have already prepared these three buttons. The button in the middle is constrained to the outer two buttons and has a width of wrap content. And if you remember from the previous videos, we said that if we... Uh, put these buttons here closer together, our button in the middle won't get smaller than web content. So the button has actually a bigger width than the constraints on it. If we wanted to have this button shrink to its constraints, then we had to set the width to a match constraints instead of web content and set the constraint width default attribute to web. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can watch part two again where I explain this in detail. But now we have a new attribute with which we can keep our web content width and still have this button shrink with its constraints. For this we just add this attribute, layout underscore constraint width, this one here. And we can set this to true. And now as you can see the width of our button shrank to its limiting constraints. If we set these buttons further apart, our button grows to wrap content size, but not bigger than wrap content. And if we put them closer together, our button will shrink again. When we remove this attribute or set it to false, we always have at least wrap content width. Okay, nice. For the next attribute, let's set the width to a match constraint or zero dp in other words. And now as usual, our button grows to its limiting constraints and takes up all the room it has available. And now we have a new attribute, constraint width percent, or of course constraint height percent. And here we can define a value between zero and one. For example, 0 0.5, which is 50 percent. But it's important to note that this takes up a percentage relative to the parent layout, not relative to the constraints. So as you can see, now it takes up 50% of the parent width, but it's bigger than the actual constraints. 0 0.9 would be 90%, 80% and so on. Okay, let's go back into the design editor and remove these buttons and place some other views in here. Now another very important features are barriers. To create a barrier, we right click on the layout, go to helpers, add vertical barrier or horizontal barrier. We choose the vertical one and we don't see anything in the layout itself, but down here we can see that it created this barrier. And now we can take some views, for example, our two text views and drag them inside this barrier. And as you can see now this line here appeared. This is our barrier, but it's set to the left side. So we change barrier direction to right or end. And now it's to the right side of the two text views that are inside this barrier. We can constrain our button to this barrier. And now when any of our two text views grows, it moves this barrier and together with it, the button also moves. When we make the other text view even bigger, it moves the barrier further away. So this is pretty much the same as the guideline, just that this position is defined by other views in it and not by the barrier itself. This is particularly useful if you support different languages, where the same word can have different sizes in different languages. It's also important to note that the barrier doesn't create a nested view. Instead, it just has this constraint referenced IDs attribute, which has a list of views that it contains. So a barrier doesn't decrease performance as a nested view would do. Now by default, the barrier also takes gun widgets into account. So when I put this text view here and set its visibility to gun, our barrier is still positioned at this gun text view here in the middle, as you can see. Now we can change this behavior so our barrier will move to the other text view and ignore the gun text view. For this, let's switch over into XML and we add the attribute barrier allows gun widgets, this one here. And when we set this to false and go back into the design tab, we can see that the barrier moved all the way to the left. And if you want to create a minimum position for this barrier, you can also put a guideline in here. We talked about guidelines in detail in part 3. And then put this guideline into the barrier. And now when we remove this text view here, our barrier is placed where the guideline is. Okay, and the last feature we want to talk about in this video are groups. For this again we right click, go to help us and here on add group. Again we don't see anything in the layout, but our group appears here. And now we can put multiple views into this group. And the only thing this can do right now is defining the visibility. So we can set the visibility of this group to invisible 
and all views in it change its visibility without us having to set them one by one. The same as for the barrier, it does not create a nested view, but has this constraint reference IDs attribute. It also has an ID, so we can reference it in Java code. So we could write group group equals find view by idea r dot id dot and the id of this group and then we can change the visibility of all the views in it with one line. You can also put the same views into multiple groups, in which case the last group has the last word about the visibility. Okay, if this was helpful, please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe for upcoming parts of the constraint layout tutorial. Take care.